So welcome everybody to our September Denton County Master Gardener Association general meeting and program. We are so delighted to welcome Tony Moorhead, who's going to present Shady Transformations for our program today. She's got uh, inspirational before and after photos of her own garden, and she's going to share some of the very best shade plants for North Central Texas gardens for us. Now, Tony's name is probably very familiar to a lot of you. She has been a Tarrant County Master Gardener since 2005 and a member of the Grapevine Garden Club since 2002. She's a Texas certified landscape professional and owner designer for her company, Signature Gardens. And so Tony grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin, but she's lived in Texas since 1986 and she moved to Grapevine in 1988. And in her former life, she was a freelance court reporter for 17 years. But in 2002, she traded in her transcripts for trowels and the lawyers for landscapes, and she's never looked back since. Tony's garden has been featured on many tours, including the Colleyville Promenade, South Lake Spin into Spring, um, and many other Grapevine Garden Club and Master Gardener tours. You may remember her from our virtual Fall Garden Fest last year in October of 2020. Tony was one of our four featured presenters, and she shared with us seasonal tips and to-dos for our North Central Texas landscape. So we're delighted to welcome you back again today, Tony, and we're delighted to see your garden, even if from the comfort of our very own chairs. So delighted to have you with us and the floor and the garden is yours. All right. Well, thank you for having me back. Um, okay. So I have a bunch of slides as I always do. So um, let's just get into it here. Um, Okay, shady transformations. This actually is a picture of my backyard um, and I have a bunch of pictures of my backyard. That's the shadiest spot in my yard. Although my front yard is becoming increasingly shady too. So probably gonna have some transformations going on up there. So I'm also gonna show you some jobs that I've done um, and, and uh, you know, approaching the problem areas that, well, the, the opportunities that shade um, gives us, let's, let's put it that way. So, all right, but a few considerations, uh, light conditions. So, you know, um, full sun is full sun, and uh, but, but shade has got some varying um, aspects up to it. So part shade, less than five hours, um, dappled light where you've got maybe high uh, canopy and the light is filtering through the, the trees. And then full shade where it, it's bright, but there is no direct sunlight and then dense shade, no, direct sunlight all day long. So think um, live oaks, you have a grove of live oaks and, and you know even to the west side, you've got more live oaks. So the sun just never gets to that ground. Those are difficult um, areas. And consider the position of the sun um, and at different seasons of the year, because you know in the, in the fall, spring and fall, it's a little bit lower in the sky. In the winter, it's very low in the sky. So maybe you do get some sun in the afternoon in you know, the spring and the fall and the winter on, underneath those trees. So that presents another challenge. You know, you've got shade all day long and then you get that blast of sun in the afternoon. So there are plants that can handle that, but it's a little limited. So you need to consider that. And then maybe even you created shade against your six or eight foot fence, you know, on the north side of that uh, is a shady little spot. So. All right, uh, plant selection. Um, you know, everybody wants all those blooms, but we need to consider other things with shade. There are, there are obviously some blooming plants, but texture is big in the shade. If you can combine the small and the fine and large and bold textures or foliage color, variegated foliage. Um, and, you know, for those blooming uh, perennials, consider when they're blooming. We have some spring bloomers, fall bloomers, winter bloomers, um, and then consider the height of your plants. This goes along with any landscaping you're doing. And then the form of the plant, um, obviously uh, listed right there, weeping, rounded, upright, uh, whether you want fragrance, whether this is the shady areas near seeding area and you wanna enjoy the fragrance of the plants. 
and then whether you need evergreen or deciduous, and then always native and adapted plants. I, I you know, said it before, I'm not a native purist. I, I will use adapted plants because as I just mentioned, gardening in Texas is hard. So I wanna use plants that work, um, that are, uh, you know, plants that are adapted to our climate because it is challenging. We have so many extremes. Um, you know, zones, we're in zone 7B, 8A, you know, maybe in Denton, you might be considered 7B, uh, but for sure down in, you know, Grapevine, Dallas, Fort Worth area, it's, it's zone 8. <clears throat> so choose plants that I always recommend choosing plants that are in that sweet spot of 6 to 9, because you get a little bit of um, protection on the cold side. Uh, if you get a, a, some plants that are rated zone six, and then you get the heat tolerance if you get them that are rated up to zone nine or even 10. Then soil prep, uh, compost always, but when you're adding compost underneath your shade trees, you need to be careful that you're not piling it up against the trunks of your trees. And then if you have any areas that are really heavy clay, you might consider mixing in um, expanded shale for those uh, plants, for instance, like columbine um, needs really good drainage. Uh, Hukura needs really good drainage. So in those spots, maybe mix in some expanded shale for those plants. And then I please don't till under um, big shade trees. We don't want to um, damage the roots of those trees. So, so just add the compost, um, but not and, and you can add, you know, up to three inches. You're not going to be piling, um, you know, 12 inches of heavy topsoil on top of your roots. Anything that's going to change the, uh, the drainage of that area for trees can be dangerous, you know, in, in their um, lifespan. So especially with post oaks, you know, they barely like us walking across their root system, let alone piling a bunch of uh, soil on top. So compost is fine, organic matter, mulch, that's fine, but just, you know, a few inches of that to protect your trees. Okay, embrace the shade. That's what this program is about, to talk about all the plants that will do well under the shade. But I see this all the time. Uh, obviously, we don't want to do what we call Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And the other picture there is where I see this all the time where, where people will limb their trees up so high just for the sake of a little sunshine underneath their trees or trying to grow turf. Um, it just, it, it, you know, we call that lion tailing or buggy whipping where, where it's just nothing, nothing, nothing in this tuft at the top and it ends up looking ridiculous in my view. Um, it just ruins these shade trees. So again, embrace the shade. Lots of plants will do well under them. And you can't get those limbs back on. So uh, be careful what you prune off. All right, again, I had mentioned this before, um, texture is huge in a shade garden. If you will combine those bold and fine textures, they just play off each other so well and, and it helps each plant to stand out. I'll be going through what these different plants are as we get into the plant list. Um, here's just an example of you know, the broad, um, bold foliage. Here combining the, the bold foliage of the aspidistra or cast iron plant and the fine texture of the Japanese maple. And, here, and foliage color too is important. So here, top two combos I use with Japanese maples um, where you've got that fine texture and the, the burgundy color. And then you combine that with the creeping Jenny to get that bright lime green. And then the other fo photo is um, the strawberry begonia or strawberry geranium to give you that silvery foliage underneath the, the weeping Japanese maple. All right, so this is how my backyard started. Um, I think I'm trying to remember if some of you came to a tour of my garden. Uh, you may have been here, but this is how it started with nothing but dirt. Uh, so obviously over many years, I've been here for 23 years, I've developed my um, backyard into um, gardens and paths. And so this is, you know, how it looked a few years ago. It was, you know, I had a fairly good sized chunk of lawn right there in the middle and everything was going fine. But you can see the leaves of that oak tree up at the top of that picture. And it started 
creating so much shade that the lawn along that edge would not grow anymore. And I have St. Augustine back there, which is our most shade tolerant grass or turf. Obviously, St. Augustine prefers sun. It will just tolerate a little more um, shade, but too shady here for even St. Augustine. So you can see, I hope you can see in this picture, um, I have an orange cord right here. That's what I do to develop my, my beds. I lay out a cord to get the shape of the lawn. I, I form the shape of the lawn and then the beds kind of form themselves. So you can see how I'm starting with the process there. So I removed all that grass and this is what I ended up with. So you can see the list of plants there, uh, but we'll be going through each of those specifically later on. But you can see how pretty that ended up. I still have that nice sweep of lawn where the sun is still out there a little bit. Um, and then I've added you know, an, a ground cover, some abelias, the tropical giant spider lily, and the carex, that Everillo carex um, along the backside, that limey colored grassy green or, or grassy look there. This is just another view of it. So right there, smack dab in the center, the lawn's got enough sun to survive. Um, you know, that may be changing as my trees keep growing, that may be getting smaller and smaller. But I do appreciate a little uh, expansive lawn just to give your eye a rest for all the, the busyness um, on the outside. So, uh, you know, we all start with shady beginnings where we have tiny little trees and we've got lots of sun around it. And then as time goes on, those trees grow. So this was my red oak tree, you know, 23 years ago, skinny little 30 gallon, but now it's this huge tree. I can't even get my arms around. So you can see the grass had to go. I've added some um, flagstone paths through there and used um, dwarf mondo in between the flagstone. And then you can see the different shade plantings I've used there. I love to add annual uh, caladiums because they're just so bright in the shade. So I usually add those every year just to give a little pop of annual color in the shade. This is just another view of that area that I took this year. Okay, this was at a client in uh, South Grapevine. And so she's got those two huge red oaks right there that and then also she had drainage issues through her yard so um, couldn't grow any turf um, and just had lots of water coming through her yard from neighboring properties so the way we transformed this yard was to add a creek bed to carry that water through her yard and then we added a big flagstone pathway along the side of that and then lots of shade plantings underneath um, the red oaks so you'll see I use the same plants all the time because they work. All right, this is just another view of that same uh, landscape. And so you can see the creek bed there, probably three different yards, um, their, their water dumps into her yard. So this is a flowing stream when it's raining hard um, and then it's a dry creek bed when it's not. But it, this is an area where you can't do underground drainage because you can't dig and get pipes. Otherwise you would be destroying the root system of those large trees. So doing above ground surface drainage works a little bit better for that to get the water moving through um, and preventing erosion, but saving the roots of those trees. Okay, this was a, a garden that I landscaped in South Lake and very sandy soil um, and all on a slope. And you can see the dense shade there. This is maybe what you'd call that dappled uh, shade. So you can see the light kind of streaming through there. It's, it's actually very hard to take pictures in this um, uh, setting because you've got bright spots of light and then you've got these dark black holes. So anyway, it just demonstrates the, the dappled light coming through there. But every time it would rain, because they couldn't grow any turf in this area, all of that sandy soil would just wash down to the bottom of their property. And um, they actually had a dry creek bed down lower, and that would constantly fill up with the sand from the upper part. So I said, well, we need to stop the erosion up top to fix the, the drainage issue down below. So this is what we did. We kind of terraced to this area. We used some large boulders up there on that upper level and added some soil up there, some compost up there. 
and then we have another section and then another section. So we planted that with um, Mondo, um, which is a great shade ground cover and soil holding um, uh, ground cover. And then you can see the limey colored carex in there. Now this is just newly planted. So all of this stuff will fill in and then the cast iron. So anyway, um, then way up top there, they actually had a, a underground spring that was constantly seeping water. So we planted golden sweet flag, which is, it's actually a pond plant. So it can handle that constantly moist soil and it actually spreads and clumps together. And um, so it accomplishes the purpose of holding soil, absorbing all that water. So anyway, just took care of this situation. And just another view of that. So how we created the big sweeps of ground cover in there. And then kind of, um, um, well, we, the, the rock edging there is a stopping point for the ground cover to just keep it neat and tidy. This was the opposite side of their yard that had just as much shade and even more erosion. This is by their driveway. So the water just comes screaming down their driveway and just kept eroding this area. So again, we added lots of um, or a, a huge creek bed in there to, to handle all that water coming through there added same cast of characters, the, um, the ferns and the, the um, leopard plant and cast iron, the carex, Japanese maples, um, oak leaf hydrangeas. Okay, this was a, a client in Keller and th this is in the dormant season. So, but you can see they had a fairly nice stand of St. Augustine in there when it was a little bit sunnier, but they got a live oak. They've got a red oak in this tiny backyard. Their backyard neighbors have trees. So it just kept getting shadier and shadier. And it just turned out to be just a mud mess at some point because the turf wouldn't grow. So anyway, we got that all landscaped with um, large flagstone and the dwarf mondo is what I love to use between flagstone. Uh, because it only grows a couple inches. You never have to do anything to it. It just hugs around all those uh, flagstones and, and, you know, helps um, with erosion and weed control and all that good stuff. This was another garden in Colleyville that we landscaped. So it just heavy shade. You can see a little bit of dappled light coming through there, had drainage issues. And so it was transformed like this again with another creek bed and oak leaf hydrangeas, ferns. Again, all the same cast of characters in there. A little bit of annual color with some begonias, dragon wing begonias. This was the other side of their yard that just was a weedy eyesore and pretty much every weed, weedy tree known to man <laughs> was coming up on their side yard. So we got rid of all of those and re-landscaped this with a nice flagstone path coming through there. There you can see how I use the Japanese maple with the creeping jenny underneath, oak leaf hydrangeas. Um, there's a fatsy in there, Japanese maple. This garden in South Lake, um, when I say it's blocked, I'm talking about the windows. They had some hollies in there, which I'll talk about later, actually do quite well in shady conditions, but they had gotten so large that they were blocking the windows. And then you can see how the turf was no longer growing under the shade of this live oak. Live oaks create such dense shade that it's hard to grow much underneath of them. And you can see they had that little circle around the tree there with uh, liriope up against it. So basically what we did was expand that bed. So we, it, it was a sloping area. We brought in some boulders to, and then we brought in some compost to, to um, level that area up a little bit. Um, but we took all that, liriope that was jammed around the trunk and we split it all apart and we got it away from the trunk. You can see up against the trunk of that tree how high the soil was on that poor tree. So we removed all of that and got that the liriope away from that and we're able to plant that whole area with divisions of liriope. And then we opened up the, the windows by removing those large shrubs which are too large for that area and used some dwarf yopan hollies and some of the carex grasses in there and a small Japanese maple. This is uh, in Keller, another, uh, this garden is under a, 
a cedar elm tree, which they're deciduous, so you get the sun in the wintertime under them, but they do create um, a, a shady canopy. And so here we've used uh, columbine and some abelias, Canyon Creek abelia, oak leaf hydrangea. There's some leopard plants in there, purple heart along the edge. So, you know, along the edge of the, of the planting area under a large shade tree, you can use plants that can handle or, or maybe prefer a little more sun. Um, and then use the ones that need more shade protection under, you know, closer to the trunk of the tree. This is at a garden in South Lake as well. Just had a very shady canopy under pine trees, um, which they in it themselves create a challenge because they're constantly dropping needles. But you know, in the in the eastern part of the United States, they use pine needles as their mulch, so you kind of get free mulch. <laughs> it's just it's constantly dropping all over your plants too, so. You kind of have to keep that neat and tidy. Um, but here she just created this, this walkway through her garden and added um, oak leaf hydrangeas. You can see the purple oxalis there. There's a tropical giant spider lily, um, persicaria. Back by the, the um, um, hammock there, you can see cast iron against the fence. So she's got a great mixture of evergreen and um, deciduous plants in there. There's some leopard plants, right? Right here. Leopard plants are what I use instead of hosta. All right, this garden here used to have Asian jasmine all around their trees. So that got removed. And then we added some Japanese maples in the wintertime. Fall is a great time to plant trees. And I know that uh, Metro Maples just got a brand new shipment of Japanese maples. So if you want to make a trip, it's, it's a little bit far from uh, Denton, but it's worth the trip to go down there in Kennedale to Metro Maples. Anyway, so we transformed this garden by planting different shade plantings, um, leopard plants and oh, um, hellebores. There's some small nandinas in here, right here. That's the nana nandina or fire power nandina that can handle some shade. There's, um, again, I mentioned the Japanese maples in there. And then on the other side of that same yard, um, they've got an old silver maple there. Not a tree that I rec uh, recommend, but it's been there a long time. It's still doing okay, but it just you know keeps creating more shade and the lawn kept declining on that area. So we just keep incrementally removing lawn and creating more beds. Uh, so we remove the, the uh, turf that was starting to decline underneath that maple, added so, uh, about a two or three inch layer of compost uh, in that area for planting. And then we added the same types of plants that we had used on the right side of the yard. We added those over here. So we create that cohesive look that just flows through the whole yard. And this is just a view of how it's all tying in with the other side of the yard. This particular garden uh, down in Hearst, again, under very two very large live oak trees, creating very dense shade on a slope. And so when it rained hard, her uh, downspouts, you could see the downspout right there, was just dumping all that water. And since there's no turf to hold that soil, it was constantly uh, running over the sidewalk there, actually creating a hazard because it's so muddy and slippery when people would walk down that. So this is what we did to transform that area. And since this is on the south side, I take that into consideration. I knew that at certain times of the year, the sun would be hitting this area. So I use big blue liriope because liriope can handle more sun than mondo grass. So then we use holly ferns up, up closer to the tree because it's going to be a little bit shadier up there, but I knew that sun might hit that ground cover area, so I needed to use a ground cover that um, could handle sun at certain times of the year. And um, you can see right here, this is where we took the downspout underground, um, and since it's sloped, we didn't have to dig very deeply to get there and didn't hurt any roots, but um, we had the downspout, if I can show you right there, now the water dumps out right here, but it's dumping out clean. It's not um, full of mud anymore. 
On the other side of that yard, here's that another large uh, live oak. She actually has three large live oaks in her front yard. So you can see how at one point there's some mondo grass underneath that tree, but it's just the shade is just getting um, more dense and uh, eating up more lawn. So what we did is expanded the mondo area. This is regular mondo. It grows about you know six eight inches, and it does spread very quite quickly as opposed to the dwarf mondo that's very slow to grow. And then you can see how um, it meets up with that area where we added the ferns underneath the um, other live oak. This is just from a dif different direction. So you can see where the old stand of mondo was and how we ex expanded that bed to increase the mondo. On the other side of the, the flagstone walkway there is Asian jasmine. I didn't want to increase the Asian jasmine bed because to me it's a little more maintenance to keep it from vining all over um, you know the walkway and the tree trunk so I opted to just leave it because it can be very difficult to get rid of but I opted to leave it and just um, create kind of that barrier so it you know it needs to be just maintained in a smaller area and then we added some caladiums for some summer color all right, uh, just showing how um, we use liriope here right underneath the post oak trees. So, you know, we don't have to mess with right underneath of those trees, but then um, she adds some annual color out along the edge. Um, and then there's along the fence there, there's oak leaf hydrangea and some akubas planted there and the carex grass. This again, that shade, that shady sloping area underneath post oaks can be so challenging because it's, you know, major erosion. So again, same thing. We added a bunch of rock on this one up higher on the, the slope um, and then added the mondo grass, a big sweep of mondo grass um, along the whole lower edge there. And then underneath them in the, the middle bed there, we use the cast iron and columbine. So you can just see how that matured. So it just created a beautiful erosion control area. Mondo grass is some of the best erosion control um, underneath shade trees. So here, this lower um, level of their yard, it's getting, you know, they've got a bunch of post oak trees in their front yard, create it, creating shade on this lower area here. And they were having to re-plug they didn't use um, sod, they just used plugs. They would replug this whole lower area every single year. And I said, why do that every year when you can create a beautiful shade garden on that lower level? So we removed all the sod and then created that. And um, their garage is right around the corner there. And, you know, they keep materials and things in the garage. So how much easier is this now to have a nice flagstone pathway to walk through to be able to tend your garden and then just added the little bench there um, so she can wave at the neighbors when they walk by. So yeah, again, added the dwarf mondo between the flagstone and then just added shade perennials. And she does get, this, is, this area has been a little bit challenging because there's when the sun goes lower in that sky, it does create a few little blasts of sun here and there. So we've kind of had to figure out what will work in those areas. Um, so it's been a little bit challenging. All right, this particular garden is on the north side of this house. And so they had some Burford hollies in there, but they were growing too tall for the, you know, they're block, you can see they're blocking half of the window there and they needed a walkway because they had just built an outdoor kitchen area right here. So it kind of uh, blocked their normal walking path. So what we did here is added flagstone again with the dwarf Mondo. And then we added that Japanese maple is called Skeeter's Broom. There are some Japanese maples, um, Twombly's Red Sentinel, um, Skeeter's Broom, uh, winter's red, I think it's called. They grow columnar, so they grow taller than they do wide. Uh, so they they fit into these skinny little spaces, like in an alcove or in this spot here. So there's so many different Japanese maples to fit the spot. But then we replaced the Burford hollies with holly fern because again, it's that north side. It doesn't get it, much, and it's a tall house. It doesn't get the sun. Um, but and then the the holly ferns won't, you know, grow so tall that they block the windows. And then 
um, oak leaf hydrangea against the house there. And you'll see, notice the hosta in the pot. I love to use hostas in pots. I, I made a comment earlier when the, when the um, before we started the program, there was a picture on the screen and I asked who's, whose garden is that? <laughs> because obviously they do better with hostas in the ground than I do because it was a whole hosta garden. Um, and they just, for me, do not perform well in the ground. So I like to use them in pots because I tend to water my pots, you know, a little more often uh, getting them up off the ground kind of deters the slugs and the snails a little bit, especially if you use a rough kind of pot. Um, and they just tend to do better for me in pots. And they certainly can handle the cold um, because as Catherine mentioned, I grew up in, in Wisconsin where it gets very cold and they grow hostas like uh, crazy up there. So 30 below doesn't even face them. So the two, little two below that we had in February uh, this year, piece of cake. So, all right, another slip sliding away uh, landscape in um, Colleyville. You can see the tree roots there. So um, they have old mature trees and obviously could not grow turf anymore. And so, and, and lots of drainage issues. There's a two acre property behind them that was just, you know, water gushing off of that property through this property causing erosion. And again, you can't put underground pipes to take drainage because you can't cut through all of those roots. So what we did was we created some planting areas built up with uh, boulders and then added some soil on each side and then put a large creek bed through all of that as a surface drain to carry all that water from the neighboring property. They already had a large stand of Asian jasmine there, so we left that and actually did increase the Asian jasmine planting in this area um, just to help with erosion control. And then we planted the cast iron, Japanese maples, um, some ferns. So you can see that. Um, this is on the opposite side of their pool. Same situation, post oaks, lots of erosion, cannot grow turf. So this is what we did. Flagstone, they needed a way to get through that area from the pool to the pool pump and to get access to their um, side yard over there. Also drainage, you know, major water flowing through that area. So created that creek bed there to carry that water. This is their front yard. We actually removed, they had three live oaks in their front yard and created so much dense shade, we actually did remove the middle live oak to give them a little more light so they could grow some turf. Um, and they still had two large live oaks left, but um, what we did is create this walking path through the front garden. And um, we used the variegated liriope and she adds some annual color up there. We have some small nandinas, we have um, kaleidoscope abelia used in there. Um, but again, she keeps lots of materials in her garage, which is around the corner, and she would constantly make that path. So we created a walking path and wide enough that she can bring a little garden cart along to help her with her garden maintenance. And then you can see the sweep of lawn that's, that is left on the outside toward the sunnier side. This garden here, um, underneath the canopy of large, uh, I believe it's a a cedar elm and then the neighbor has a, a post oak and a um, yopon ha, large old yopon holly so created lots of shade over there lots of drainage issues so again we created the, the creek beds and the walking paths and then added japanese maples um, it's a little bit sunnier um, on on this what would be the lower right of the picture so we could add the lambs ear there and some spireas but um it, it just gets denser shade as you go toward the uh, left of this picture in the backyard same thing post oak trees that you have to be careful under so we did add compost um but didn't do any tilling uh, again toward the front of this bed is is the west side so when the sun is setting at certain times of the year it does catch that front part of the bed so we were able to add a red bud there and the kaleidoscope abelias and some purple heart and um, Katie's Ruelia, but then as the closer you get to the house, the more dense the shade gets. So we could use a Cubas and a maple and some ferns there. 
just another view of that garden. This is interesting. I'll talk about this plant uh, as we get into the plants, but they have this um, um, Chinese ground orchid, I believe it's called. Yeah, ground orchid. Um, and I remember seeing that on one of the Denton County Master Gardener tours, and it was such a cool plant. But anyway, this this particular homeowner um, bought the property or got the property from their parents when they passed away. And when I went to their garden to see what you know we were starting with, I noticed all those ground orchids. And I'm like, oh my goodness, do you realize the plant that you have here? This is so hard to find and it's such a cool little plant. And obviously had it been thriving in neglect all in, in dense shade all those years. So for 30 years. So we salvaged that plant and I was able to plant it again in basically the same spot that it was in. Um, so anyway, that was just kind of a fun, fun find. Just the same list of plants that I always use there. All right, so now let's talk about um, the different plants. And so I'm gonna go through understory trees and shrubs, ground covers, perennials, grass bulbs, and then just a few annuals at the end. Um, so uh, Japanese maples, Obviously not native plants, but they do well, work well in our area um, as understory trees. You know, uh, they, a lot of them come out of Oregon where they can grow them in full blasting sun up there, but we just can't do that here. Um, so you're going to need to plant them. Morning sun's okay, but um, afternoon shade is pretty necessary with them. Um, they can still crisp up a little bit, but um, their spring uh, <clears throat> spring color foliage and their fall foliage, like last year's fall foliage was spectacular. We had such an awesome fall last year. This is just a, a look of it in the spring. So I, I just love my, I've got, I think 29 Japanese maples. So just love them. Um, and I, I, wat, I do supplement with water according to restrictions. So I don't have to, I don't feel like I baby them or give them any extra than I give anything else in my yard. Uh, but I do, you know, have a sprinkler system and run it um, in the middle of the summer. I'm running it twice a week, according to restrictions. And then spring and fall, I back way off of that. And then the winter, I only run it twice, once every two weeks if we don't get any rain. Um, so red buds, another great understory tree. Uh, lots of different varieties of red buds. We've got the Eastern red bud, Oklahoma red bud, Texas red bud. There's burgundy hearts and forest pansy that have the burgundy colored leaves. And then uh, rising sun red bud and um, hearts of gold is another lime colored red bud. They, this rising sun, the tag says it only gets eight to 12 feet, but I had one that got 20 feet. So, um, don't believe the tag, everything grows bigger in Texas. These will perform better for you as far as blooms in more sun, um, but they will tolerate uh, shade as well. Um, Nandinas, now I know Nandinas get a bad rap, but these are Gulfstream Nandinas. They don't spread, they don't produce berries. There are other Nandinas, uh, Firepower, Nana, Obsession, Lemon Lime, um, that don't spread and don't produce berries. There's ground cover types like Harbor Dwarf and Flirt um, that to, I think Nandinas are indispensable because they do work in the sun and they do tolerate a lot of shade. So I, I use them, I love them. Here you can see where they're planted um, on the right-hand picture there with leopard plant and violets and ferns. And this is on the north side of a bed at my church garden. Um, I, and they've done amazingly well. And the other picture is in my garden where they are underneath um, the canopy of um, an Althea. And um, there's a, um, an arbor that ca casts shade in the afternoon on this area. And then my li red oak is casting shade. So they get a lot of shade. Um, any kind of holly, um, so many different kinds of hollies will tolerate shade. They can handle full blasting sun, but they will tolerate shade if you want an evergreen. Um, and, and they handled our freeze beautifully this year. So if you didn't like hollies before, <laughs> I, I hope the freeze changed your mind on them because they took it like a champ. Um, Carissa is a great replacement for Indian hawthorns um, if you lost your Indian hawthorns in the freeze. 
And Indian hawthorns will not tolerate shade. So not on my list. And they're not on my list anymore because of the freeze and entomosporium fungal leaf spot and bagworms and you name it. Anyway, cherry laurel. Um, I These did take a hit in my garden from the freeze, but my cherry laurels are, you know, they're, they're native. They just were here. They will grow 20 feet tall. They create a nice evergreen screen um, for me in my backyard. So I just kind of let them go. I did have to cut some of them to the ground and now they're coming back great. Um, as, as more shrubby looking, but they will grow and get back up to 20 feet, I'm sure. But they are a nice evergreen um, for, sh for the shadier areas. They will tolerate that shade very well. Abelias. Um, abelias are the just kind of my go-to shrub for those areas that are a little bit too shady for some plants, but they still get some of that dappled light. So these are you're, these would not do well in dense, dense shade, but if you can put them to the outer area of um, the tree canopy or an area where maybe they're getting that blast of afternoon sun or they get morning sun, um, as long as they get a few hours of sun, they will still perform very well. And there are so many varieties of abelias. I absolutely love them. I love their fragrance. I love their form. I love that they uh, attract pollinators. I just have all good things to say. Now some like the kaleidoscope did take a hit with our freeze, um, but I think we're worth replacing because I think that freeze, you know, we're not gonna see that again in a very, very long time. Uh, but the other varieties I have like um, Canyon Creek, um, Rose Creek, uh, Edward Goucher, uh, Glossy, they all took the freeze like a champ. There's Edward Goucher. Edward Goucher has pink blooms. Canyon Creek has pink, blo pink blooms. The rest of them all have white. Akuba. Now, if you want a plant that needs dense shade, Akuba is it. But it does also need good drainage. So if you have this in an area that is staying too wet, it's not going to be happy. It will rot. Um, so maybe this is a spot where you'd need to mix some expanded shale in there and make sure you've got really good drainage for this plant, but uh, it just cannot tolerate sun. The, la the leaves will turn black if it gets too much sun. Maybe a little morning sun would be fine, um, but protect it from afternoon. Um, there's, this is a speckled variety called gold dust, and I also have a, a solid green variety, and it gets those big red berries on it, so very cool plant, and this, there's a, this solid green one is smaller. It'll grow about three or four feet uh, tall and wide, whereas the gold dust, um, in really good conditions, can grow six to even up to 10 feet tall. Um, I rarely see it that large. Um, it grows very, they both grow quite slowly. Hydrangeas. Now, the, the uh, mop heads um, or the large leaf, they're water hogs. So I, I usually don't recommend those a lot. Maybe use them in a container or in a spot that you know, and maybe your sprinkler hits, hit system hits a little bit more or you're willing to give it a little more hand watering. Um, but oak leaf hydrangeas do amazingly well in our area. I don't think they need any fussy care at all. Um, there are dwarf varieties like ruby slippers um, that grow about four feet tall and wide. And then there are large varieties like uh, Ellen Huff and Alice that will grow eight, 10 feet tall and wide, enormous shrubs. So give them room to grow. There are lace cap varieties like this lady in red. Um, now there are paniculata and arborescence varieties as well. I personally don't grow any of those, but maybe if you do, Put a little thing in the chat and tell me um, uh, what conditions you grow it in and do you have to give it a lot of extra water and I mean I just came back from a trip to see family in Wisconsin and they can grow paniculata varieties up there in full blasting sun um, and they're blooming their heads off and you know no extra water so we just can't do that in Texas but um, I, I'm just curious if, if you've tried them I they grow they bloom on uh, new wood so you don't have to worry about freezes with the, the paniculata varieties because you're going to trim those back by a third every year but the endless summer varieties and lady in red and the oak leaf they bloom on old wood so you, you 
Don't want to prune them if you can help it. If you have to prune them, do it immediately after they're done blooming. So be, because they need to set their buds, you know, on old growth for the following year's bloom. Okay, uh, American Beauty Berry. You could put this in the shrub or the perennial category. Um, I have a client who has never pruned hers and it's eight feet tall and wide and glorious. Um, I tend to cut mine back every year down to about 18 inches because I like it to stay a little bit shorter, about in the four foot range and, um, so, and keep it bushier. There's a white berrying variety as well. The birds love uh, this plant, native. Um, Mahonia, uh, this is leather leaf Mahonia. Boy, this took the freeze like a champ in my garden and um, it is a great plant for shade. Um, and it gets these yellow blooms on it that are followed by these purplish blue berries. So it's a great um, bird or um, wildlife plant. Now there are other varieties of this plant. I have tried Soft Caress. I had high hopes for it, but it could not take a, even a lesser freeze than we had you know, this year, but it absolutely died in this freeze. So I, you know, if you're going to use soft caress, put it in a very protected spot, maybe put it in a container that you can bring in um, for the winter, um, just, or be, be willing to cover it because I, it's definitely not as cold hardy, but I did love the fact that it, it's not prickly. That's the only thing I have against the um, leather leaf is that it's so prickly. So you might want to put that in an area that you're not walking by all the time. Um, you know, if you have, if your air conditioner's in the shade, don't plant leather leaf Mahonia next to it that you have to have an air conditioner guy come in and, um, <laughs> you know, check your air conditioner a couple times a year. They won't appreciate that. Um, okay, Fatsia or um, Aurelia. Um, this again also took a little bit of hit with the freeze, uh, so be sure to keep this in a protected area, but when it's happy, it's happy, and it's just cool, broad, you know, bold foliage, and it gets these really neat uh, white puffball blooms on it in um, the winter time, so kind of fun, December, January time frame. Um, I actually took these pictures up in Garvin Woodland Gardens up in Arkansas, so if you get a chance to go up there, that's a great uh, garden. But I grow this in my garden. I've had it here for probably 20 years and every few years it will take a hit from the freeze, but then it'll grow back. And so I've kept it, but um, it, it just know that going in, you may need to protect it if you've got a vulnerable spot. Uh, Caria japonica, I, I personally do not grow this, um, but I would like to try it and you maybe add some some comments in the chat if you grow this and what you think about it. This is one of those plants I've been leery about because it does sucker. Um, I don't know that I would call it invasive, but um, it it does suck, tend to sucker, send up you know little plants underground. Uh, but it does bloom in the shade. It will get about four to six feet tall and wide. I love this um, you know uh, kind of free form arching form to it. It has it's also called Japanese rose and it's beautiful. Um, this variety here has the double. Uh, bloom. I think there's a single variety bloom as well, but the double is what you'll see most of the time in the nursery. But anyway, I'm curious on your experience with it because I personally don't grow it. Um, but I would like I would like to try it um, for the blooms in the shade. All right, um, this is a prostrate U um, called Plum U uh, prostrata. This grows wider than it does tall. A uh, very, very slow, painfully slow growing. So I uh, know that going in, but it handled the extremes of the cold. It has handled the extremes of the heat. Um, and I grow it underneath a red oak tree um, because I wanted something evergreen underneath that. And I have it in a couple other spots in my yard too. So I love the ferny uh, foliage on this plant and um, that the fact that it's evergreen and like zero maintenance. I wish it would grow a little bit faster. Uh, this is another kind of U that I grow called Utopia. It is a Southern Living uh, Plant Collection plant. And um, I have this underneath a crepe myrtle uh, that gets, it just gets 
very dappled sun in this area. Um, and it will grow about three to four feet tall, uh, a little more upright than the prostrata. And you can see it kind of has a, that needly looking foliage, but it's very soft. That's what I love about it, very soft. So if you need a deep evergreen, uh, soft um, texture shrub for your shade garden, this is a good one. Uh, all yews need excellent drainage, so know that. Um, they, they just will croak if they have uh, soggy soil. Um, there's uh, another one called Densiformis that grows even larger. It will grow four to six feet, um, probably four feet tall and six feet wide, so very upright and wide growing, but same similar foliage to this. Um, now the Podocarpus yew, the, the tall uh, yew, uh, sustained a bunch of freeze damage this year, so I really don't recommend that one uh, just because of the, the freeze damage. All right, coral bells, um, I mean coral berry, sorry. Uh, I took this over at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens. It, it, this is a, it will form a, a thicket. So this one does a sucker up and, um, and spread. So if you have an erosion area, I have it in the way back part of my yard behind my magnolia against um, my fence and a creek area to help with erosion control there. Um, so it gets a little purple berries on it in the, you know, and uh, holds those through the winter. And then um, it just forms a little, maybe three to four foot tall and kind of mounding shrub. Camellias, now they do prefer acidic soils, but if you're in the, you know, East Cross Timbers area, you may have that sandy acidic soil that these will do well for you. The Sasanqua varieties bloom in, more in the fall time frame when we're less apt to get a freeze. There are the Japonica varieties that bloom more in January that can a lot of times get nipped, the buds can get nipped by freezes. Um, so just, you know, do your research on that. There's many different growth patterns. Some grow huge, 10 feet, some are more low and wide growing, um, but be sure to prep your soil if you don't have acid soil. Use, you know, uh, peat moss, pine bark, um, and you may have to keep acidifying that soil um, because predominantly in Tarrant County um, and Denton County, we have uh, alkaline soil. Um, this, now I'm going to move into the ground covers. This is Asian jasmine. We're all familiar with Asian jasmine. Um, just, I love, I took this on a garden tour over in Fort Worth. And I just love the use of these large sweeps of ground cover here. The taller in the back is actually that prostrata U I just mentioned. So they have a large area because that's a really wide, uh, it, it spreads by growth form, but not spreads by, you know, rhizome. So it has that low but tall spreading form to it. So they started with that and then they stepped that down with Asian jasmine. And um, I don't like using, using Asian jasmine in with shrubs or other plants. I strictly like to use it, if at all, by itself or underneath one large tree. I just don't like it climbing up into shrubs or other plants. I like that clean ground cover look to it. Um, and again, I showed you this picture before, this Mondo grass is an excellent shade, a loving ground cover underneath dense shade. Um, this is the tall variety that gets six to eight feet inches tall and spreads very quickly and um, loves the shade, needs the shade. This is at my church garden where we have the sloping area and uh, this does get west sun under there. So that's why I chose to use big blue liriope under this live oak because it's going to get that, so possibly get that west sun. Um, so I need, I didn't want to use Mondo here um, so that the liriope could handle the sun, but it worked very well here. We had a huge erosion issue here. I use cobblestone along the edge because water comes off the of downspouts and flows into that area so we wouldn't have that erosion. This is another kind of liriope called silver dragon. Um, there's uh, silvery sunproof, which is the non-spreading variety of variegated liriope, but this is the spreading version called silver dragon. So make sure when you're going to get a variegated liriope that you get the variety that you want. This silver dragon has that more silvery, really stark white um, variegation to it, whereas the silvery sunproof or the variegated liriope that's clump forming has more of a creamy white and green and it does not spread, it just stays in a clump. But 
I, you know, this was that huge garden that has sandy soil with lots of erosion. And so we had lots of large ground cover beds. So I wanted to use some uh, different um, interest in the ground cover. So it wasn't just a solid sweep of green. We had this silvery look to kind of break it up in there. So um, a juga is a, a good ground cover. Um, as well. Lots of different varieties of ajuga as well. This is just your regular bronze beauty here. I love the, the early, early spring, spring blooms um, on it. And this is a variety called Catlin's Giant. So very large leaves on that and a little bit bigger blooms. I mean, the blooms on this in the springtime are just spectacular. Um, okay, this, I mentioned this before, I showed you this picture where I used the um, Strawberry begonia or strawberry geranium. Um, the leaves kind of look like a geranium, but yet it looks, it performs like a strawberry where it sends out little runners and then they root in, but it's it's not invasive in the least. It's so shallowly rooted that if you needed to remove it, it's, it just comes out very, very easily. This does, and, and my garden has taken at least a couple years to establish a nice stand of it. So um, be patient with it, but I love the early spring blooms on this, just little white dainty blooms, and then that evergreen foliage on it. Okay, for, uh, horse herb is a great ground cover for those tough areas that, you know, it's a native, um, you know, you can't get anything else to grow, try horse herb. It will work in those dry shade areas. It's not evergreen, I wish it were, but um, it comes back faithfully every year and um, gets these dainty little yellow blooms on it. And it's just a nice medium green. It will grow about a foot tall, but it's mowable. I actually grow this between stepping stones and my husband just mows it. So it, we keep it very low, um, but you know, it works really well in that application. And I also grow it underneath a Japanese maple that's kind of on a slope that um, I've had struggled getting things to grow in that area. So tried that. Um, all right, wild Chinese ginger. Um, I took this picture at the Dallas Arboretum. Um, this, is a, this is a ground cover, so be sure you um, put that where it can spread. Um, but it's evergreen. It's got really cool silvery variegation on the foliage. Um, and yeah, really cool plant. This is um, Lamiastrum. Um, this will get a really cool yellow bloom on it in the springtime. And I love that silvery variegation on this plant as well. Um, great for the shade garden. Now Turk's cap, I'm sure we're all familiar with that. It will grow in full blasting sun or it will grow in shade. It's gonna be a little looser formed and maybe not bloom quite as profusely as it does in the full sun. Um, but it won't spread as much in the full sun, I mean, in, in the shade. Um, and, you know, it still attracts the hummingbirds. Um, I just, I don't know, I just think Turk's cap is indispensable. But um, some people might think that it spreads too much, but this is how I keep it under control. Uh, after we get a freeze, I, uh, and so all the stems are, are revealed, I go out there and I pull up any of the long stems that have come down layered and rooted in. I yank them back to the main plant and cut it off. So I keep it to the main plant. If you don't do that, it will send out the big long stems and they root in and they root in deeply. And the next thing you know, you have a thicket of Turk's cap. Um, but if you'll just do that every year, yank up the, the rooted stems and, um, pull it back to the main plant, you'll keep it in bounds. Um, Aspidistra or cast iron plant, boy, if you did not protect this in February, mine took a major hit. I had to cut it completely to the ground, but it's all back up now. So it, it survived, but um, you know, it came back from the root, but it did take a big hit. So if, if you're farther north, you may wanna protect this if we have another horrible freeze. Um, but there's, I, I grow a variegated variety of it. I have a, a couple different variegated varieties. So um, I just think this is indispensable in a heavy shade situation. I love the form of it, that big, broad texture. Uh, holly ferns, we're, we're all familiar with those. Awesome in the shade. Um, they did take a little bit of a hit in the freeze, but mine came back. I think I had to replace a few of them um, that, that, were damaged too severely, but most of the time this is a bulletproof um, evergreen 
burn for us. And I, I always have to, I always get this question from people, what's this disease my holly fern has? Those are just babies, you know, ferns in the making, just spores um, on the back, but we don't have the right climate to, that they would grow from those spores. You're gonna have to have a highly humid, um, moist area in a fern growing operation to get those to, to you know, start from spores in our gardens. Anyway, I, I use lots of holly fern, love it. It's my go-to plant for a shady area underneath a low window. So, you know, it, normally with um, our homes, we have these windows that are a foot and a half off the ground. What are you gonna put in front of it that's not gonna grow up over your windows? So there's several small shrubs that you can use. Um, well, there's a few small shrubs that you can use for sunny areas, but when you've got shade, heavy shade, there's not as many options. So holly ferns are my go-to for that application. Uh, of course, we've got autumn fern, again, evergreen, and they give us that kind of um, coppery colored new growth. They're evergreen as well, if I didn't just mention that. Um, wood fern is a deciduous fern, so it gives that really soft, um, um, light green uh, fern, fern texture. Now, I have found that wood fern actually prefers to be kind of on that outer edge, um, that really bright shade area. I haven't had this do as well for me in dense, dense sh shade. Um, so it actually can handle a, a little more sun than you would think. And deciduous, so when it dies back in the fall, I just, uh, after a freeze, I just cut it to the ground. Japanese painted fern. Um, this one here stays much smaller, but it has interesting foliage to it. Um, that's silvery with the darker uh, burgundy center to it. It can be a little finicky though. Uh, I know um, the grumpy, what's his name? Grumpy gardener, Steve Bender with Southern Living. He, this is kind of on his never plant list because he thinks it's so finicky. So I, I think it doesn't like a lot of competition. I think it likes to be by itself. So maybe try it in a pot um, or just, um, put it more in an area by itself. But it doesn't get very big. It only grows about a foot, two foot and a half tall and wide. I just love the, the foliage color on it. Um, calicacia or alocasia. Calicacia, the leaves uh, face downward. Alocasia, they point upward. This is a variety I have called California. You can put this in a bright shade area. I actually have mine growing near my pond. Um, so they, they do like a little more water. So, um, you know, use it in a spot where it can get that. Um, purple heart, again, it's one of those plants like Turk's cap that I think are, one day my whole garden is going to be either Turk's cap and purple heart because it can handle either full shade, full sun, anything in between, and you can't kill it. Uh, so here I have it growing in a full sun spot, but and this is another variety called um, pale puma. That's a dwarf variety. Uh, I love this variety because it stays more compact. But you can see here how I grow it in the shade in my backyard. It's a little more green when it gets more shade, but it will handle either sun or shade. Maybe not super dense shade, but where it gets a little dappled or a morning or afternoon. This is one of those plants that would work great if you're getting a blast of afternoon sun that nothing else will grow, Purple Heart will. Uh, Red Dragon Persicaria, this is a great foliage plant. It gets teeny tiny little white blooms on it, but I grow it for the foliage. Um, and this is very, very easy to start from cutting. So if you know anybody who has it, take some cuttings, root them and pop them in the ground. Very easy to start. It will grow about, oh, three feet tall and wide, um, just really interesting foliage. Uh, this is what I like to use as well instead of regular hosta. I use African hosta, Dremiopsis maculata. It, it's more of a bulb and um, it too needs good drainage. So it'll rot if it has too much water. Um, so maybe this is a spot, mix that expanded shale in there. It's also called little white soldier because of the blooms. Um, but comes back faithfully uh, when it first comes out in the springtime. It's got those uh, little um, darker spots on it. Looks like a leopard frog to me. Um, but I have planted this kind of in a drift um, and the bulbs divide very easily. After the blooms uh, finish, you're gonna see these little round, um, there's little seed pods or, or 
balls, little round balls uh, that are left over, if you will pull those off and scatter them around, you get little baby um, African hosta plants. I just discovered that this year. I've grown this plant for years and I've never tried seeding it around, but it worked. So, um, leopard plant is also, or farfugium, that's what I use instead of hostas for my shade garden. They've got big, bold foliage. Um, there's variegated varieties. I rarely see the variegated varieties here at nurseries, but you can order those online. I got it from Plant Delights Nursery. Um, there's a giant leopard plant that grows giant. Um, then when they do bloom in November is when they bloom with those yellow blooms, let those blooms go to seed. And you'll see these almost look like a thistle or a dandelion bloom. Let those dry completely, scatter them around in your yard and see if you get some baby plants. I get tons of baby leopard plant in my yard from doing that. So um, I just love, love, love this plant. It, uh, it just has done so well for me. Uh, bear's breeches, um, big, large, bold foliage, and then it gets these really cool blooms on it in late May, early June. Um, it starts looking a little crummy late summer, so I cut off all the old foliage and it's starting to send up, now that it's, you know, we're getting, approaching fall, um, it's starting to send up new um, leaves again. But give this a, a, a good bit of space and maybe some morning sun, it'll bloom a little bit better for you. Okay, uh, variegated Solomon seal. This can be quite difficult to flat find, but if you do, it's it's been a great little perennial for me, and it gets these sweet little yellow bloom or white bell-shaped blooms on it in the springtime. I just love that delicate uh, variegated foliage. This is another cool plant. If you know somebody who's got this, get some starts from them um, and scatter some seeds around it. It's it's a really really cool. Um, perennial for our area. Um, and it gets that very cool um, gray variegation through the center of that kind of chocolate colored leaf. And then it gets these really cool little violet blooms on it. Uh, mine are blooming right now. And I do, I gather the seeds and I scatter them around. Um, not invasive in the least. Um, it, it grows, it transplants very easily. Um, it's just a great plant. It grows about a foot tall and wide, and then the bloom stalks come up to maybe two feet tall. Um, coral bells or uh, hookera or hookerella. Hookerella is just a cross between a hookera and a tiarella. Um, again, these need super, super perfect drainage. So I grow them in pots. They tend to do better for me. Um, if you can grow this plant, hats off to you. Um, I do struggle with it, but I have a Southern Comfort variety that I've had in a pot for many years and it's done well for me. In the ground, they, it's kind of like hostas. They just don't do well for me in the ground. So try them in pots. Alabama Sunrise is a very good variety. It was actually bred to handle our Southern um, climate. If you find any of the uh, hookera or hookerella varieties that have some southern name in them like southern comfort or alabama sunrise um they tend to do better in our climate um then like my sisters can grow these up north like nobody's business but it's cold cold up there um viola odorata uh viola odorata um this is sweet violet i don't recommend wood violet because i think it's invasive um, but this is a very well-behaved variety right here. It stays in a clump. Um, uh, wood violet is a state flower of Wisconsin. I brought it from my uh, parents' yard and planted it in my Texas garden thinking, how cool would that be to have the state flower of Wisconsin in my Texas garden? Uh, not cool, it took over. So I spent a year getting rid of it and then I now grow only this variety here because it's much better behaved. Uh, here's that Chinese ground orchid I was telling you about that I discovered on that um, garden that I did where the, they had bought it from the homeowner and they didn't or from their parents and they didn't really know what they had and I was like oh my goodness this is such a cool plant so <clears throat> it forms this um, clump of maybe one foot tall wide bladed uh, grassy look and then it gets these delicate little orchid blooms uh, that come up above it so very cool shade plant if you can find it um, maybe some of you have some to share 
All right, this is another unusual one um, called Japanese Sacred Lily. N not a whole lot to write home about on uh, blooms. It gets a, a little red, weird looking bloom right at the ground level that you'll probably never even see. But I like this one because of the wide foliage and the fact that it's evergreen and it handled our freeze <clears throat> like a champ. And so um, I just like the texture of it in the winter time. Uh, but it only grow about a foot tall. Um, it's very easy to divide and transplant. So I've started kind of moving that around in my yard so I can have that evergreen structure in my shade garden. So it's just a different plant that we don't see all the time. I got this over at the Dallas Arboretum many years ago, but kind of be on the lookout for it because it's, it's just an interesting evergreen shade plant. Um, hellebore. I love, love, love hellebores because they bloom in the wintertime when nothing else is going on and they're evergreen. My favorite variety is uh, the, the Frost Kiss line and specifically this Molly's White. I like the white blooming varieties in the wintertime because I leave my leaves in my beds for the winter for a little extra protection and the pink blooming varieties tend to kind of fade into the leaf color. Um, of the you know the fallen leaves, but the white blooming varieties really pop out against um, the, the brown leaves. And I also love the fact that it's got this variegated foliage. All of the varieties in the Frost Kiss line have that variegated foliage and they stand up very strong and upright with very strong stems. A lot of hellebores just face downward. You almost, almost have to be lying on the ground to appreciate their blooms, but this variety stands more upright. But to appreciate their blooms, what I do is I cut them off and I float them in a bowl of water. I love doing that. So here I just have a collection that I was floating in water and I threw a couple pansy blooms in there too. I love doing that in the wintertime to bring the blooms inside. <clears throat> oxalis, uh, lots of different varieties of oxalis. Um, these can tend to get rust fungus on them when we have a really wet uh, spring, but all I do is just rip them off at the ground. I leave the little corms in the ground, but I rip the tops off, throw them away, maybe remulch the area, and then they come back clean. So um, I just have tons of oxalis in my yard. Uh, oxalis works great with variegated ivy here. This is at a client um, who, who has it in a little window box because they can both take it fairly dry. In fact, that ivy, if you water it too much, it will croak. So I find ivy, variegated ivy in a shade uh, container um, that works very well. Uh, Columbine native, there's a red variety that's native as well. Uh, blooms March, April time frame. Um, then it kind of goes dormant in the summertime, kind of looks crummy. After it's done blooming, I cut it to the ground. And um, then I just let it come back in the, um, it comes back in the fall when it starts cooling off and then it'll be there for the winter and then bloom again in the spring. Needs excellent drainage though, so make sure you improve your soil if you've got heavy clay. Um, this is just showing it, this is on the north side of my house. It looks sunny right there, but it's really not in the, um, you know, in the winter and um, spring and fall because of the angle of the sun and my house blocking it. So I've got you know, oxalis growing there, like you've got wood fern growing there um, and columbine back up toward the house and an oak leaf hydrangea. Okay, spider lily, tropical giant spider lily. Um, I love this plant. This is another one that's kind of that part sun, part shade. You know, if you've got a little bit too much um, shade, but a little too much sun, um, you know, either area, it'll work great. Anything between full sun, I wouldn't put this in full, full, full shade, but anything kind of on that part sun, light shade situation, it'll do great. And it gets these really cool blooms on it in July. I think the common name is uh, Fourth of July Lily. So that's usually right about when it blooms. This is a picture at my church garden, uh, right next to that ground cover bed I showed you. Um, so this is where it gets that west sun. So total shade all day long and a blast of west sun so you can see that it blooms a little bit more and it gets a little bit thicker when it gets a little bit more sun but tolerates the shade beautifully. Uh, black and blue salvia is a salvia that will tolerate some shade. I have it here growing in here with my oak leaf hydrangea. Most salvias as you know need full blasting sun but this variety will tolerate more shade. It does spread a little bit though so 
uh, know that going in that you might have to keep it in bounds. Um, it's not going to spread as aggressively in the shade, though, as it will in the sun. Um, another type of sage that will handle some shade is the Salvia madrensis uh, or Forsythia sage, where it gets these really cool uh, yellow blooms on it on very dark foliage. Um, this may be a little frost sensitive, though, um, in extreme uh, extreme years, so you might have to protect it. But on a normal year, it will come back fine. Um, Katie's Ruelia is the dwarf uh, form of Mexican petunia. I don't care for the large variety of Mexican petunia because I think it's so invasive. And this variety here as well will pop a lot of seeds, but to me, they're very easy to maintain. And I love it for those small areas at the front of a border um, where you maybe get a little more sun at the edge. Um, again, this is another great one for that late afternoon blast of sun. Um, plant where you know underneath a, a tree they can handle it dry they can handle it wet they can handle anything that's what I like about them um, one grass that works in the shade is uh, inland sea oats uh, it will all of these seed heads will germinate so mm, uh, know that going in it can spread by seed prolifically so just know that going in um, this is another type of grass that I am thrilled about because it does work in the shade. These are carexes or sedge. I have used this Everillo in containers. I've used it in the ground. There's a variety called Evergold. There's one called Everest. Lots of new varieties um, coming out with this. Now, um, I don't grow any of that Berkeley or Texas sedge, uh, but those could be used in place of uh, like a Mondo or a Liriope as a ground cover. These varieties I'm showing you in these pictures are more clump forming, but the Berkeley and the Texas sedge are actually ground covers. If any of you grow that, you might um, make a mention of that in the chat because I'd be interested to know um, how long you've grown it, um, how it works for you um, on, on the Berkeley and the Texas. But um, I listened to a program by uh, Patrick Dickinson over in Dallas. Um, a few weeks ago, and he that's what he grows instead. So you might check into that for a ground cover. Um, if you'll notice in this picture on the top left, there's pittosporums growing in that. Um, I don't recommend those. They, they do actually handle the shade, but boy, are they cold sensitive. Um, they're all dead from this last February, but I have seen them sustain um, damage from much lesser freezes. So I usually am not a fan of pittosporum for that reason. Um, but anyway, um, one bulb that I know does well in shadier conditions is Spanish bluebells. I love to plant this in with um, uh, columbine because they bloom right about the same time in that March, April time frame. And I love that blue and yellow combination. And then we're getting close to the end here. Uh, Caladiums, these moving into the annual um, plantings. Um, Caladiums are my go-to for adding a pop of color in the shade. Um, they're an annual bulb. They're tropical. You don't want to plant those until um, the soil is 70 degrees, which is usually around Mother's Day, but then you get great color all summer long. And uh, I also use them in containers. Dragon wing begonia or whopper begonia, hands down, undeniably one of my favorite shade um, annuals. Um, they, they just bloom all summer long. I plant them in April and they will go until it freezes and even sustain a little bit of a, you know, a freeze. So great plant. Um, I also use coleus in the shade. Um, I love the, the foliage color and there's a bazillion different kinds of foliage. There's um, hanging trailing kinds and there's the, the upright kinds. Um, I, I plant the full sun coleus in the shade and they still do great. Um, I also use pentas. Um, I've gotten away from using impatiens because they're so uh, thirsty. Um, and they also had a, a, a time where they were suffering from downy mildew. They may have bred that out with better varieties, but I use pentas in the shade. And so you can see that I have them growing here again next to caladiums. This is up at my church garden um, and I grow them at my house in the shade. They do quite well. Okay, and the last transformation I wanna talk about is transforming our leaves because because we have all this shade it means we have a lot of trees and they drop a lot of leaves as you know 
So let's transform those leaves into compost and put that back in your garden. So um, I have a little compost pile and my all of my trees um, keep that compost pile very well supplied <laughs> with material. So, um, all right, well, that's pretty much it. I just wanna mention a few uh, websites just for, um, for more information. As I always mention, any question that you have about any plant or any you know, um, disease or insect or anything, if you will just, when you Google it, just put tamu.edu either before or after whatever subject matter you're Googling and you will get Texas A&M <coughs> researched information. Um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, saveterrantwater.com. I've also done some other programs that they have um, uh, recorded. So if you wanna go watch any of those on different types of plant material and landscape design and all that, you can go watch those. They have lots of great information there. And I'm sure Denton County has um, a similar site. Uh, Texas Smartscape, texassuperstar.com, uh, the Native Plant Society of Texas, if, you're, if you would like to research more natives. And of course, any of the Master Gardener websites, y'all have your own. Um, great sources of information. And then I do have a blog and I'm on Facebook and Instagram. So I try to post um, not always just pretty pictures, but try to forward some um, informational um, topics on there as well. And then these are some of my favorite gardening books. Of course, Neil Sperry, we're all familiar with him. Steve Huddleston was the um, hortic chief horticulturist at the um, Fort Worth Botanic Gardens, and he wrote the book Easy Gardens for North Central Texas. Love, love, love that book. Play uh, Native Plant Society of Texas, um, or Sally Wazowski's uh, book on native plants. And then Greg Grant, who's out in East Texas, I do like his book um, just for landscaping ideas um, in design. So that, my friends, is all I have for us this morning. I hope I didn't take too, too long. Um, I hope that you. Um, Got some great ideas and inspiration, and that's all I have for today. If I have, if you have questions, I'm I will be happy to entertain them. Thank you so much, Tony. That was chock full of education and inspiration and information. We appreciate all your time and putting that together. And we do have a lot of questions in chat. We'll see how many we can get through if you're game. Sure. Okay, so first question from Liz, what soil amendment do you use in that big sandy area of erosion and how do you get it to mix in without damaging the tree roots? Compost, compost, compost. That is all we add is compost and we, we don't till it in. We just, as we're planting the plant, it in effect gets mixed in while you're planting that plant. Does that make sense? So, you know, it's basically a big top dressed area so that the whole area is getting the compost added. But when you plant the plants, you're mixing it in then. And then I just, you know, let the worms do the rest of the work. They can mix it in over time. Um, so that's how we approach that. So we're not damaging large root systems by tilling. Perfect, thank you. And Karen's asking, do you have a sprinkler system in your shade gardens? I do, yes, I had. You know, when I moved here 23 years ago, I had a lot of lawn and we had underground sprinklers set in and um, I left those and I just planted beds around them and I don't have an ideal situation. Ideally, you, you know, you want your lawn separated from your beds, but it would cost me $10,000 to redo my sprinkler system and I, I can buy a lot of plants for that. So I just work within the bounds of my uh, sprinkler system. So like I do grow some of those mop head hydrangeas, but I know that my lawn sprinklers hit that area three times with rotors. So that's the one little section I will grow that plant because I don't have to drag a hose. I don't like dragging hoses. So I just tailor the plant material to what my sprinklers cover. And, um, you know, if I, I do have some drier areas, so I have to tailor those. And uh, so anyway, yeah, I just work with what I had. Um, but ideally, if you can get them separated, you know, lawn from your beds, it's, that's the perfect world, but yeah. Awesome. Debbie's asking, uh, Tony, what rock do you like to use for your borders and your paths? I use Oklahoma flagstone for paths. Um, 
I just think it's such a natural look. Um, it, they're usually, it's, you know, kind of tannish, but you'll get some veining uh, and, and areas of darker, you know, some charcoal colors, kind of a little bit of terracotta, some grays kind of mixed in there too. So I just like the look of Oklahoma flag. Um, then for boulders, I like to use moss rock. Uh, I just like the, and the lumpier, the better. I just, the more character, the better. And, and um, you know, if, if it's in an area, in a shady area, and you've got some moss growing on it, and, um, you know, that's always adding a cool feature to it too. Sometimes when we have city water, it wrecks that moss and it won't grow in it. And of course, in the middle of July, we don't get moss growing, but as soon as it cools down or in the springtime, when we get more rain, uh, that moss will sometimes come back. Um, I like the lichen that grows on them. So anyway, I just like moss rock boulders. And then for uh, cobblestone, I use either Colorado or Arizona or native. Um, Arizona is a little more pinky and gray, very smooth. Um, Colorado is um, or, or the native is a little more brown and a little more rustic looking and Colorado is kind of a happy medium between the two. You get the pinks and the browns and the grays and but you do get some white in there too, which I don't, I don't care for the salt and pepper. It's too shocking looking. It's very white with black specks on it and it's all uniform. So I prefer either one of the three, Arizona cobble or Arizona, Colorado or native. Thank you. And Michelle's asking, Tony, is there any potential impact to the post oaks and other trees from the weight of the boulders and or the dry stream beds on the roots of those trees? And in a follow up to that, Pam's asking, do you line your dry creek beds? Lining the dry creek bed, yes, with um, uh, landscape fabric. The only time I use landscape fabric is under rock. Um, to keep the rocks from sinking down into the soil. But, um, you know, that in those areas where the dry creek beds are, the water is gonna flow through there regardless of whether you have it going through eroding soil or whether you have it going through eroding rock. And it's gonna percolate back down into that soil. So it was, you know, to me, I'm just moving the water through um, that area without, you know, to and preventing erosion. Um, I don't, you know, and it's not covering necessarily a whole area. It's just that creek bed moving the water through there. I haven't seen it cause any damage to post oaks, but, you know, uh, post oaks are finicky, very finicky. You have to be very careful underneath them. Most of the time I'm trying to use more just ground covers underneath of them because that seems to be the least um, disruptive to them or just mulch um, if you're not on a slope. But um, I, you know, interesting question about the weight of the rock. I suppose if you have a huge, huge area, like that one landscape we did where the whole top hair area of it was that, but that the, where we used the rock was not right under the trees. It was way out, a, 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 you know, at the very edge of their canopy. So um, yeah, I, I haven't seen that be a big problem. Um, now, I have heard you don't want to use, uh, we don't usually mulch with rock here because it can compact the soil, um, but I think if you have a mixture of, if you're using some rock, use it in, um, you know, don't have all rock, use some areas of rock and some areas of mulch and some areas of planting, so you kind of have a balance, so you're not all or nothing, so. Sure. Thank you. And Liz is asking if caladiums do well in pots and if they can be overwintered in pots. Um, they do excellent in pots as long as you keep them watered. Um, they, no, as far as overwintering, no. I mean, you have to take them, you would have to take them out of that soil, let them dry out, set them to the side, protect them for the win from the winter because they can't even get to be 50 degrees un you know, unprotected. So. They're definitely a tropical. Uh, to me, they're not worth the trouble. I just buy new bulbs because they're fairly inexpensive. Um, our, you know, my master gardener and um, Grapevine Garden Club, we sell bulbs every year. So I just buy new bulbs every year. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. We've got so many questions. I might do a couple more and then maybe to address the rest of them, we could do a little virtual Q&A sometime um, and interview you with the rest of the questions. Um, but a couple more for right now. Debbie's asking, what is the best way to get rid of Asian Jasmine? Um, this is, it's hard. I mean, you, you have to dig it. You have to dig it and carefully if it's underneath trees, you, you can't just take a pickaxe to it. Um, you just have to carefully, carefully dig it. Um, I, you know, um, whether herbicide would work, I would be really nervous about using, I mean, if you're going to use a herbicide on it, like glyphosate, I would, I would want to cut it down first and let all new fresh growth come up because that new growth would be tender and it, it's not going to kill it when it's old growth because it's leathery and it just, it's just not going to penetrate, but you have new tender growth might work on that. Uh, pretty much just digging and digging. That's why whenever I see Asian Jasmine, it just, and I want to remove it, it just makes me panic. Uh, but my guys have been able to dig it out and get rid of it. You just have to, you know, keep watching the area for any little areas that try to come back. So digging carefully, pretty <laughs> much it. Talking about things that keep coming back, Carrie's asking, how do you keep the grass from eventually choking the creek beds when those beds are placed within the lawn? I do not put creek beds in lawn. I do not have lawn bordering creek beds for that very reason. One, doesn't really look natural. And two, whenever you weed eat that edge, you're throwing grass clippings into the creek bed. It's a constant maintenance hassle. They are always within a bed. Creek beds are within a bed surrounded by plantings, but not lawn. Okay, thank you. I keep thinking we'll stop, but I keep seeing more questions. So Danette is asking, what's the best ground cover to help with erosion in an area that gets shade most of the day, but gets that blast of late afternoon sun, like you mentioned in one of your slides? Big blue liriope is what I use because it can handle the shade, but it can also handle that blast of sun in the, in the late afternoon. Uh, so that's, that's kind of my go-to, but you know, check that Berkeley sedge and Texas sedge. Again, I've never used them, but I, I know um, Patrick Dickinson with Rooted In highly recommends those, but I've just not used them. So I don't have any experience to share, but big blue liriope is the spreading liriope or that liriope um, silver dragon, uh, the one that's real uh, kind of silvery grayish looking, um, that one would also work well. It can handle that afternoon sun, but you know, also can handle the all day shade. So one awesome. of those two. Mondo, probably if it's getting that blast of afternoon would not be happy. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's wind down with these last two questions. Well, they're not the last two, but maybe the last two for this morning. So do you prune purple heart to keep it in check? And if so, when? And do you have any tips for suckering plants like Yopon hollies, suckering trees like Yopon hollies? Uh, purple heart, anytime purple heart gets out of bounds, you snap it off. <laughs> you can go in and cut it or you can just snap it um, and you can give it to friends or you can throw it away. Um, yeah, I, I'm constantly snapping mine off because I'm giving it away to people because um, I love using that dwarf variety, that more compact per, uh, pale puma. But yeah, anytime, just if it grows where you don't want it, snap it off and, and let it thicken up a little bit. Um, any time, there's no wrong time to prune back Purple Heart. Um, and then as far as the suckers on Yopons, um, there is a product called Sucker Stopper or Sucker Punch. And um, it's, you know, you put that on those suckers, it's not gonna kill the tree. Like you cannot use um, um, Triclopur or 2,4-D on the suckers because that will actually kill your whole plant. You just use the sucker punch or sucker stopper um, and put it on those uh, cuts because it'll just stop it. All it is is a growth inhibitor. Uh, so it, it will give you about six months of 
um, stopping that growth, but it's not going to kill the suckers. It's not going to kill your tree, but it'll give you a little bit of time. I just prune them. Um, I just get in there and cut them as low to the ground as I can. Um, and that's what I do. It's just garden maintenance. One of those things. And that's what them, I do too. It seems them, like I have to do it like every few weeks almost. <laughs> um, it just, some of them seem to sucker worse than others. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, crepe myrtles, they're, they're genetically shrubs and we're forcing them into being trees. So they're trying to be shrubs and we just have to keep forcing them to, to be trees by cutting off those suckers. That's just the nature of the beast. So. Sure. Sure. And so Tony, I know you've got a wealth of information on your website and on your blog. Is, is your shade list there? Could folks reference that on your website or your blog or your Facebook page? Um, I have the full plant list on there when I did the 12 months of color. So all the plants are, that is on there, but shade specifically is not, but I could put it on there. Uh, maybe I will do that. Yeah. Or we can just watch, uh, we can rewatch our presentation to our heart's content mm -hmm. until we have it all memorized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's, well, that's we so appreciate too. you being with us today. You've been a great friend of Denton County Master Gardener Association for a long time, and we value and appreciate you. Well, I am just grateful that to uh, share, you know, my experience with you. Um, I, I love sharing plant and landscaping information. So thanks for having me once again. Um, Y'all have a great rest of your day and a great fall. And I'm so sad that your um, tour was canceled. So sad. I have always enjoyed that. So maybe next year, right? Maybe next year. Maybe next year. I agree. So on to the spring of 2022. <laughs> right, right. All right. Thank you again. And um, I, I have no problem if anybody wants to email me a question. That's totally fine as well. I'm happy to answer or, uh, you know, post something on my Facebook page or whatever. That's totally fine. So, Thank you for yeah. that offer. So folks, if your question didn't get addressed in the meeting today, um, she's graciously offered her email um, and you are welcome to do that. And Tony, we will look forward to seeing you the next time. Sounds good. Thanks, y'all. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a great afternoon.